You, you know, you know what I kind of think is funny in this modern world? When they talk about robots taking the jobs of bricklayers, uh, the intelligentsia doesn't bat an eye. When they talk about, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles taking the jobs of truck drivers, uh, the intelligentsia doesn't bat an eye. But then when the AI looks like it might take something like screenwriters' jobs, which are a good job, a right job, a smart job, people lose their damn minds. This, my friends, this, my friends, is what we call bigotry. But they don't call it bigotry because it's the right people being bigoted. When the intelligentsia, when the academic classes are bigots, that's just, that's just smart thinking. When the blue collar folks are like, help, our jobs have gone away, we can't feed ourselves anymore, well, they just need to learn how to code, now don't they? So I think this is kind of interesting. So we have a screenwriters strike going on right now in the United States. So uh, the screenwriters, apparently for television shows, I think it's television shows, maybe movies, don't care that much, honestly. They are currently on strike and they are demanding better pay because the system that they're currently in kind of honestly screwed up. Like they have a point, they do have a point. But we can talk about it all anyways. Um, but so basically what's going on, what's interesting, right, is that uh, uh, for screenwriters, for television shows, um, previously, uh, if you were brought on for a television show, uh, a television show generally had about 24 episodes uh, per year. So per, uh, a season was during a year, uh, a standard run of a television show was 24 episodes, unless it got canceled or something like that. Uh, and so because it was 24 episodes, uh, a lot of the, the media companies, the production companies, when they hired on actors, when they hired on writers, uh, basically they would the, the, the employees were committed to only work on one show or only work on one project. So when you think about it, you know, basically if a show uh, takes two weeks to create, right, there's a lot of money going into each individual show, it kind of sort of makes sense that if you're hiring on staff that essentially that they're restricted uh, to only working on that one show. The issue that we want to run into in the streaming world, though, is for some reason, I still actually don't understand this, uh, streaming seasons are 10 episodes long. Uh, one of the big issues, though, is for all these employees, uh, the standard contract is you can only work on one show at a time. You go from 24 episodes a year to 10 episodes a year, and that's a, that's a massive change. It's a massive difference. Uh, not only that, but for a lot of these writers and other employees, they would get uh, residuals, right? Uh, so every time an episode would run, so every time you watch an episode of The Big Bang Theory or even Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, there is money that the uh, the broadcast company pays uh, to whoever owns the uh, the, the content, uh, and then from that there's residuals that go out to each each actor, each writer, or the whole nine yards, uh, and so that keeps them fed. So the idea being is you know during the during the boom times they make money, and then during the lean times they still have residuals coming in uh, to be able to make them you know financially viable. Uh, so with streaming services now, basically what they want to do is they just simply want to pay for the product. <clears throat> we will pay you a hundred million dollars but when we pay you a hundred million dollars that's it there are no additional checks being written so the issue is especially for a lot of these writers is that even if oh they write for the next big bang theory for the next uh, friends for the next star trek the next generation for shows that that may live on right for for decades and decades and decades uh they don't they don't actually get any additional value for that if they write for a flop <laughs> they get a paycheck and if they write for the next big bang theory they get a paycheck and that is that and so the the writers uh, the writers contracts were up and so they decided to strike 
And now, I don't know, we get a weird little world. We get a weird little world. We get the modern world. We get the modern world where what is going on is not what you think is going on. So you kind of got to be careful what you're striking for. I think one of the most interesting things about the writer's strike right now and what I'm paying attention to is I think this is awesome for the uh, for the for the studios i think this is awesome for the people that actually create content uh, again the television shows because this is a great way to axe budgets and cancel projects and not scare the schnizzle out of the investors, right? So here's one of the big problems you run into in the real world of business. <clears throat> a lot of these companies, whether they're Apple, whether they're Netflix, whoever else, these are publicly traded companies. The sad reality is, as many times for publicly traded companies, uh, the, the profit is not the most important thing. Their revenue isn't the most important thing. It is the stock price. And stock price goes up and down. <laughs> Anything. Anyways, to be clear, when I talk about Bitcoin, the only thing stupider than Bitcoin is the stock market. People are like, look, Eli, fiat currency. It's always funny with like, like Bitcoin. People are like, fiat currency. It's like, hey, have you ever seen the stock market? But that's the weird thing. Like with the stock market, stock goes up, stock goes down. Like you literally see, you will literally see where companies uh, have increased revenue, have increased profit, have increased things, but they miss, they miss what the target increase was by a little bit, and then their stock will get hammered to high hell. Like that's the kind of th that's the kind of thing that can happen with the stock market. Like you can your company can be rocking and rolling, and your stock can drop at the exact same time because I don't know investors are spooked or whatever. And so that's a big concern with a lot of these companies is many times they realize their business plans are bad, right? They had an idea, they're working the idea, and they're realizing, oh crap, this is a dumbass idea. But here's the problem, right? In a sane world, in a sane world, they would just ax projects. Uh, we had an idea, we had a plan, we tried the idea, we are obviously not getting the results uh, that we expect, we kill the plan, right? That, that's what should happen in a profit world, in a revenue world. Yeah. But in an investor-led world, the problem is, is that the real money is what the investors are willing to pay for your stock. And so the issue becomes, if you ax, a plan that has turned out to be bad that might spook investors again that's where we saw with uh, with netflix right netflix lost like 200 like last year it was like a year and a half ago a year and a quarter ago you know netflix lost something like 200,000 subscribers uh, and so they can so they had all the issues with ukraine uh, they 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 basically shut down all of their operations in russia plus you had other things going on um, and they lost 200,000 subscribers right Oh no, right, yeah, right again, to be clear, in a sane world, that's something to pay attention to. In, in a sane world, eh, maybe the stock's not worth quiet as it was yesterday. In our world, my God, their stock value dropped by two thirds. They had gone from a $300 million valuation to an, or a $300, $300 billion valuation to an $80 billion valuation just because investor sentiment changed. Why this comes up right now is we are in the middle of the streaming wars and most of these streaming companies eh, have bad plans. Have bad plans. They have obviously bad plans. Uh, it's just not working out. The, the companies are losing money. The companies are not gaining subscribers. Basically, they have dumped so much money into creating very garbage content. Uh, and that, that was their idea. What the idea was, the more uh, original, the more exclusive content we have, the more valuable we will seem to the, uh, to the users. Users will come on, we'll get more and more users that'll pay for more and more content. Uh, what's supposed to be considered a virtuous cycle, investors are happy. Uh, the issue is, is that they create really garbage content. Users come users see the garbage content and users go away. And basically for a lot of these streaming companies, what they've realized is that this just simply is, is not a good plan. Again, I even look at this like with Disney. Um, I've seen most Disney movies, uh, not the Eternals. I still refuse to see the Eternals. I have no idea why I want to see superheroes planting corn. 
That's what I got out of the trailer. <laughs> it was like, good for you. Good for you, Disney. You have your superheroes plant corn in Africa. I, I just don't really want to see a movie on it. But anyways, I've seen most of the movies. Uh, but one of the things, I've, I've just never, I've literally never seen any of the D Disney Plus shows. And the reason is, is because they, they look pretty crappy. Um, I had Disney Plus for a while, like six months. I had a free membership back, back a couple years ago. Uh, and I was watching The Mandalorian, right? Everybody's like so excited about The Mandalorian. Oh, yeah, The Mandalorian. What can you say about The Mandalorian? It is better than the latest trilogy. It is better than the latest trilogy. That's about all you could say with Mandalorian. Like, watching The Mandalorian was really weird because it was like, it was like literally watching somebody play a very, very, very boring video game. It was like, hey, let's watch somebody play a video game. Oh, okay, maybe. Yeah, they're gonna play a walking sim simulator. You're like, Rip? Really? I'm gonna watch somebody else play a walking simulator? That, that doesn't sound too fun. So anyways, right? No, no, Disney has pumped billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, into shows that people just really don't care about. They've got the intellectual property, but, but that's about it. Again, I've seen the trailers and I've seen the reviews. Uh, I, was inter I was interested in Hawkeye. I love Hawkeye. Like when I was a kid, I used to read Avengers West Coast or no, it used to be West Coast Avengers, then it turned into Avengers West Coast. I know that, because I read it back in the day with Hawkeye, with, uh, with Scarlet Witch and Vision and whoever the hell. So I love Hawkeye. I was so excited that they're going to come out with a Hawkeye show. And then I saw the trailers for the Hawkeye show. And then I saw the reviews. I saw the nice reviews for the Hawkeye show. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't care about that. Kind of like Picard. I was so excited to see a Picard show. Again, for my generation, you have to understand, for my generation, uh, the Star Trek The Next Generation was so significant, and Picard was so significant. I had a buddy of mine going through the Navy, Naval Academy as a Marine, and one of the books he had to read was a book called Make It So. Like, literally, literally the leadership philosophy of fucking Jean-Luc Picard is what a Marine Naval Academy a student, what are they all called? Um, the cadet uh, was reading, right? That's how significant Picard was for my generation. Uh, and they came out with Picard, and I did. I got sick. I got COVID. I got COVID. So once I got COVID, I was like, fine, I'll I'll give it a try. <laughs> I got through like two episodes of Picard. I just couldn't do it. Like it's not about woke. Go woke, go pro. I don't care. It was so boring. It was so like. Let's watch a Jean-Luc Picard walking simulator. This is horrible with CGI. So anyways, a, a big issue for a lot of these, uh, these companies is that they're, re they're, they're realizing that they have too, much, too many contracts out there to create too much essentially crappy content uh, that isn't going to give them the returns that they want. Again, if you look at Netflix, how many shows has Netflix come out with now that you don't even know about? You might even actually like this show, but they they dump everything at this point in time, right? You go to Netflix, man, they'll have spent so much money on some project. They, they put it there, they'll advertise it for like two days and then flip it off to the next thing. Like, you don't even know when the content comes out. And so a big issue with uh, with these companies is they, they had a plan, they were working the plan, the plan was failing, miserably but they couldn't tell the investors that the plan is failing miserably so what do they look for they look for an easy out they look for a way to kill projects where they don't have to say their plan is wrong because the other thing too is if you say your plan is wrong then that brings into question the decision making capabilities of the ceo now again everybody's going to make mistakes warehouse workers make mistakes ceos make mistakes but in the investor world uh, right the ceo makes a mistake everybody loses their damn mind and so a big thing here is okay so we have projects that are that that are categorically failing everybody knows that they're failing but we can't say that they're failing because that means that was a bad use of funds right also on top of that if we say that it's failing that means our executives made a bad call we don't want the investors to think that our executives made a bad call so what can we do what can we do about that if we are executives and we're at a publicly traded company how can we kill a massive number of projects and basically say 
Don't blame me. I tried. And so the curious thing that comes out is what happens if you have a massive writer's strike? What if, what if all the writers for all the shows you want to throw in the trash can decided that they're not going to work anymore? Hmm. That might, oh, that might just work. That might just work, right? And I think an interesting thing that we're looking at right now is that I actually do believe the writer strike, the writers striking, it is best for the Netflixes of the world and the Disney's of the world and the production companies of the world because they can start axing a metric crap ton of contracts. Because what are we going to do? We had we had a timeline. We had slots. The writers are now now striking. They talk about that right now. There's something like it's like 500. There's something like 500 scripted shows being created every year. It might be even more than that. Like it used to be like 125 scripted shows. Now it's like 500 scripted shows on top of all the news, on top of all the uh, oh reality shows and all of that kind of thing. And so I think what's kind of interesting taking a look at this is that this is a good way to literally just eviscerate um, all of the, all the contracts that have been created to to create content basically without making the executives or the companies look as if they made a mistake. And then what they can do is they can then, you know, find the contracts that they care about, find the people that they care about, and once the writer's strike is over, just bring them back to focus on those particular projects, which becomes an interesting question, especially in this modern world, too, where we're in a streaming world, right? So I remember the last writer's strike. So the last writer's strike was in 2007, 2008, uh, and it killed a show I loved. It killed a show I loved. <laughs> it was such a good show. It was like a show, it had first season, then it got canceled. Then the fans, the fans rallied. We got it back. And then the writer's strike happened. And it got killed again. It was like this end of the world show. I forget what it was called. Uh, but it was really cool. It was like this, this farming town in the middle of nowhere. And then like World War III happens. Like literally nukes go off. And then that's the idea of what does this small town do when it appears that, that Armageddon has happened around them. It's really, it's just a great show. I had good actors, had good writing. At least I thought, I don't know, 16 years ago. I might not think about it the same way now, but back then I really liked it. Here was the thing, right? Uh, back then, streaming was definitely nothing near what, what it is today. Barely anything back then. And so you had the normal production run. So you you create your uh, you create your seasons. Uh, people watch a season. You keep them excited for the next season. And then they'll tune in for the next season, the whole nine yards. The, the issue with the writer's strike back then, again, like with that particular show, the fans really liked it. CBS or whoever it was did bring it back. Right in the middle, the writer's strike happened. And CBS just gave up on it it was like okay it was a hundred so it was a hundred day writer's strike so a show that they had already wanted to cancel it goes through a hundred day writer's strike and then once that strike is done then you have to get everything spun up to actually start putting out content again and so a lot of a lot of shows a lot of actually pretty decent shows at the time got canceled um, because you know, you're in that world and that pissed off and that genuine genuinely that pissed off a lot of consumers because we wanted the show one, we wanted to watch the shows, and then two, we wanted the shows to continue. The interesting thing to think about, though, is now I'll tell you something here. It's not 2008 anymore. What? What? What do you mean? It's true. It's it's 2023. I think a lot of folks don't realize that. And in the modern world. Many of us do not watch shows the way that we used to. And so time shifting, and when I talk about time shifting, I'm talking about time shifting by years or decades uh, is now a real thing. So my wife and I, I don't know, what's it called? Hope Town or whatever. I don't know. We've been watching this show called Hope Town. Some, I don't know, some Britbox show. And the th interesting thing about it was, like, it started in, like, 2019. So we, we watched the 2019 se season, and now we're watching the 2020 season, and then we'll go off to the next thing. Like, when my wife and I find shows now, 
many times they started in 2010. So you start a show that started in 2010 and you keep watching it for a couple of months. Then you find another show that started in 2012 and then you keep watching it for a couple of months. Now think about this. Think about this, how we now consume content. If the writers strike, when the writers went on strike in 2008, it immediately, again, as consumers of video content, expecting new shows to come out, it immediately affected us. Uh, the writer's strike happened now, and okay, <laughs> I didn't notice. Literally didn't. It does not affect my life in any way, shape, or form. If, if the writer's strike goes on for 50 days or for 100 days, 365 days. Here's the interesting thing. If it went on for 365 days, I might actually notice at that point. Would it be a big deal, though? I talk about this with uh, the rise in minimum wage, right? So people keep pushing the idea of a $15 an hour minimum wage, which may or may not be a good idea. One of the things that I bring up, though, whenever anybody talks about $15 an hour minimum wages, is that many businesses that we currently have uh, simply do not function at a $15 an hour minimum wage, right? When you look at all of the McDonald's and the Wendy's, all of the fast food joints, uh, when you look at so many uh, crappy convenience stores, when you look at so many kind of garbage businesses we have in our society, uh, the reason that they function at all is because of the low cost of the employees that they're able to get. Now, again, when I say that, people say, well, it's not a low cost. That cost is borne by society. Therefore, they should pay more money. Fine, whatever. The point that I make, though, with this is that if you raise um, minimum wage at $15 an hour, again, when you raise a minimum wage, you're not only raising the wage, but you're, you're raising the taxes, all right? The politicians never talk about that. You're demanding an increase in taxes, and you're, you're increasing things like insurance. Um, workers' comp costs more for a $15 an hour employee than it does an $8 an hour employee. And so when you look at it, you're not going from $8 an hour even to $15 an hour. You're going for probably $12 an hour when you look at taxes and everything, somewhere around $12 an hour uh, to $20 or $22 an hour. The amount they actually pay for these employees is a lot more significant than people realize just by their paychecks. Uh, and one of the points that, that I just try to make is that means a lot of um, convenient, uh, a lot of fast food restaurants will simply go out of business. Will all fast food restaurants go out of business? Absolutely not. But if you look again, whether it's a good thing for our society, you look at all the fast food restaurants, you know, Taco Bell, right beside KFC, right beside McDonald's, right beside Wendy's, right beside Burger King, right beside Arby's, right? What, hap what happens if, if three uh, out of four of those fast food restaurants simply fail? Go away. You might notice it, but are you really going to care? People might care that are the people that were working for those fast food restaurants, but for most of us won't even really notice, right? And that's an interesting thing to think about with this, this modern way we consume content through streaming is the big question of will, will consumers demand, will consumers be up in arms because they're not getting a timely drip of half-assed, irrelevant, television content, video streaming content at this point in time. Again, when you when you add on YouTube, when you add on podcasts, when you add on all of these other ways uh, to, to consume content and be entertained, uh, it's interesting, right? I just started playing um, Zelda. Uh, was it Tears? Tears of the Wind? I don't know. The new Zelda game. And I was taking a look to see how long it would take to beat. Do you know you can play Zelda for over 100 hours? Apparently, there is enough content in Zelda, the new game, <laughs> to go for over 100 hours. And that's apparently before you get even to the really stupid stuff you can do with Zelda. And so again, we did not have that in 2008. 2008 video games still basically ended. We had massive, massive online MMOs or whatever. Some people played that, but now the, the distribution of video games and how long they last is an entirely different world. And so it's kind of interesting to take a look at this and see the writers going on strike. And they're like, we're going on strike. And we we're, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that the these these development companies these they, they that they they feel the pain, 
And what's curious is I don't think most of these development companies will feel the pain from pissed off customers because I think far fewer customers are actually going to be pissed off. Far fewer consumers are even going to know this is happening. I mean, this is so We are now so distanced from the, 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 the content creation you know, was a machine that I think most people don't even realize this shit's going on. Uh, and then beyond that, again, for the development companies, it's a good reason to ax millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in projects, which then becomes interesting because if you ax all those projects, then when you do reach a uh, agreement with the writers, <clears throat> you know, well, yes, you will give the writers that you keep more pay and benefits. I mean, think about that, right? If, we're, if, we're, if they're putting out 500 scripted shows a year right now, let's just say, uh, for, the, for the American market, and we know most of them are garbage. We know most of them are right trash, right? If, you, if, you, if the development companies uh, increase the, the pay and benefits of the writers by, let's say, 10%, uh, plus gave them more stability or more flexibility or whatever else, uh, at the exact same time, they were able to ax. I don't know, a third of the writers, no longer pay a third of the writers that are not actually bringing in revenue anyway. Isn't that a win for the development companies at the end of the day? Again, it's interesting, like being a YouTube content creator. Again, not me, not me. I'm not, I'm not that impressive. But you look at the Philip DeFranco's of the world, you look at the PewDiePie's of the world, you look at the, uh, the Mr. Beast's of the world, and do you realize, again, in the intelligentsia, and the ivory towers, they are still looked down upon because they're not real media. Do you, do you want to compare and contrast the viewership statistics of most of the trash that's getting published to Netflix right now compared to Mr. Beast? <laughs> I mean, think about this. These are shows that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to create. And I bet you Mr. B smacks them down with every damn video he puts out. And so if the crappy content that people aren't even watching anyway doesn't have to get created anymore, right? Where do things stand? And I think it's also interesting, too, and this is one of those big questions to ask yourself, is the whole idea of what's better on the aggregate. So it was interesting. I was listening to a politician years ago, and it was talking about globalization and that globalization is better for Americans. And then one of the people, one of the, the interviewers said, well, yes, but how do you tell that to people in the rust about? How do you, what about the, the, the people that are laid off and their houses are no longer valuable and all that in the United States? And the interesting thing the, the politician said was, he said, please understand, this makes the United States better in the aggregate. What, the, what that means is globalization makes the world better for more people, even if some people get displaced. So you may have had a $100,000 job. Your buddies may have had a $100,000 job. If you can bring 20 people up and the cost is bringing 10 people down, then on the aggregate, more people, or no, I guess if the cost was five people down, then on the aggregate, things are better. More people's lives are better now than they were before. That doesn't mean some people didn't have the foundations ripped out from under them. The thing to be thinking about here with the writer's strike is, again, is this, is this kind of like an aggregate thing? If, if two-thirds of the writers get better pay benefits in the whole nine yards... And all it cost was one-third of the writers uh, to basically be permanently displaced. How does that work out at the end of the day? And you know, and you know if that happens, right? The, the writers' union will take that as a win. The writers' union will say, we won extra pay, benefits, job security, whatever for our members. And then, you know, they'll, they'll overlook all the people that are now no longer working as writers. 
one of those things to kind of ponder. The other thing, too, with all the, the writer's strike that, that came up, and again, it's the interesting thing with bigotry. One of the things that I don't understand, again, my, my family is, you know, deep roots in West Virginia. A lot of my family is in the Midwest. And in my, in my family, we have, we have PhDs and we have factory workers. I don't, again, there, there's good and bad, honest, to be true, honestly. There's good and bad on either side of that, right? And so one of the things is, I've never, I've never really looked down on, on truck drivers. I've never really looked down on factory workers. I know a lot of people in, in my, you know, right, in my circle, right? And they, they work their way out of that coal mining town or whatever. And it's not simply that they work their way out of the coal mining town. It's now that they look down at those people that they left behind. So, you know, those those shallow-minded, bigoted, small-town people, right? So I, I have made something of myself, and those people just rot where they are. Right? There's this big mentality, especially in academia, in academia and intel the, 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 the intelligentsia classes. And what's kind of curious with this is that we've seen how many people laugh off the idea of automation destroying blue-collar work, right? When people talk about autonomous trucks taking truck driver jobs, the intelligentsia isn't crying about it, right? There's a bit, a bit of ego in there. Almost as if those truck driver jobs should, should go away. Again, we talk about uh, robots, and be, you know, doing brick laying or building, building, uh, building houses, you know, a 3D printed houses, which to be clear is still stupid. <laughs> oh my, have you seen? Oh, people, I, I'm not, look, look, we can, we can add manufacturing capacity and rapid manufacturing and all that to the building projects. 3D building is kind of stupid. When you, when you look at like prefab construction and then you look at 3D printing, anyways, not going to go there. But here's the thing, right? When they talk about 3D printing houses, it's got to take away construction jobs. It's not, but they think it will, right? It's almost, right? Well, those, well, those, uh, those bricklayers, right? Those, uh, those, 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 those uh, drywall nailer uppers, what the hell they're called, those painters. Yeah, well, that's what they should expect for not having a real job. Right. And that's the thing. And the idea, the idea is the real jobs are doctors. The real jobs are lawyers. The real jobs are accountants. The real jobs are, are bloggers, bloggers. What? Why? Why would anybody go out and build houses when they could do real work sitting at their computer creating blogs that nobody's going to read? Right? But there is that. There is that, that looking down on. And one of the things that I caution with bigotry is bigotry is bad. Bigotry is bad. Bigotry is not bad just for them being bigoted to other people. Bigoted, bigotry is also bad for you being bigoted to other people because it blinds you to the reality. Let me explain reality, boys and girls. Hey, intelligentsia, let me tell you something. Computers understand your job a hell of a lot better than they understand how to lay a goddamn brick. You know what I'm saying? It's like accountants. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be one of those blue collar workers. They're, they're going to have those robots come out, and they're going to, they're going to take all those, uh, those, uh, those brick laying jobs. And it's like, have you ever laid a brick? Like, no, seriously, I know, it's a rhetorical question, but seriously, have you ever laid a brick? You got to line everything up, you got to get the brick, you got to do the more. There's a lot to lay in a brick, and, it, and if a computer is going to do it, a robot's got to do it, it's got to do it in real time, in a three-dimensional environment, with other crap going on around it. It is hard for robots to lay bricks. You know what's not so hard? <laughs> for, for computers to be able to figure out accounting. Hmm. Account. Basically, your, your company made a payment here. They made it to this company for this item. That gets categorized this way. And so let's change some records in the database. Your company made money from this customer for these products. 
So we change some values in the database. Oh, it's tax time. Hit run tax button. Here's all the pre-filled out tax forms. Do you realize, again, we, we don't need AI for this. Again, there's this weird thing. People are like, AI is going to take care. Dude, oh, my, my, my motherfuckers, motherfuckers. <laughs> you don't need AI for accounting. Accountants literally should have disappeared about a decade ago. I still pay an accountant. I still pay an accountant a lot of money. Do you want to know why? Inertia, because the system has not caught up. And so therefore how the system works, you end up needing to, needing to have a human being in the middle of the process, more or less just to be a human being in the middle of the process. The reality is, you don't need a human being, especially if you pay for things uh, with, with electronic means, credit cards, e-payments, whatever else. All of that can literally, simply, essentially get dumped into a database. You hit the run button and all of your accounting issues go away. Again, you look at legal issues. One of the big things with legal is legalese. What does this actually mean? As you have computers <clears throat> understand things like legalese and human terminology more and more, they get a larger and larger uh, history to understand how previous court cases go. Uh, you know, AI can take over as lawyers' jobs relatively easily. Even doctors, not surgeons, again, got to be careful here, not surgeons. But as I say, I go to the doctor about once a year, I've got some kind of generalized problem, end up the insurance company ends up paying the, the doctor 200 bucks for my, my stupid appointment. And literally it's like, I have a wart or I have eczema or I have something. And I'm like, what's that? Here's the thing. If I went, what's that? And I put it in front of my camera and I click the take picture button. I'm pretty sure the AI could most likely, or a computer system, most likely could give me a better diagnosis than the doctor. I could say, what's this? These are the places that I've been in these six months. This is where I currently live. A whole bunch of other information. You don't even need AI. You just need correlation, database correlation. And I could say, okay, you are X. You are in this place. You are most likely around this. This is what you have. Go get this particular drug. The reality is, is most doctors' jobs could go away. <sighs> but the bigots don't see it that way. The intelligentsia bigots don't see it that way because, wait for it, they think they're the superior race. <laughs> Again, have you ever done blue-collar work? Have you worked with your hands? Seriously, when your when your when your plumbing gets backed up, how long do you think it's gonna be until we can have a plumber robot? Again, think about this from a technical standpoint. Think about accounting and think about what accountants do. All right, think about that. Now think about plumbing and think about what plumbers do. Okay, keep those in your mind. Which one of these things do you think is easier to automate? But it's funny, the thing that's easiest to automate, the thing that should have been automated damn near 15 years ago at this point, the people that do that, they think they're, they're still all high and mighty. And they, they would dread the thought of their kids laying brick. Anyways, why I think this is interesting with the writer strike is I saw this from a computer person. So I don't know if this is you, if this is you, eh. but uh, so I have a lot of people. So on LinkedIn, I have a LinkedIn account. If you follow me on LinkedIn or whatever, I just follow back. I don't really care. Right. Uh, but anyway, so, so I, I was looking at my little feed uh, yesterday and it was interesting because a computer person. So, so a pretty significant, pretty, pretty high, high professional level uh, computer person basically put this post uh, <clears throat> onto Twitter uh, and it was linking to like a CNN article on this person that was using AI to automatically write books, add images to books, and then sell that on some like Amazon-ish type thing. It wasn't Amazon, there's some other writing list out there. And they made like $2,000. They made a couple thousand dollars. And so this was the big thing. Like, look, look, they're having, this guy's having AI write the books. The books are then being sold. Ah, 
Uh, and the, but the curious part about this was, right, this is a computer person. This is, the computer person cross-posted this, right? Professional, whole nine yards. And basically what they said is, I stand with the, 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 the writers for the writer's strike. Like, this is horrible. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. Why is this horrible? Is it horrible to put truck drivers out of work? Is it horrible to put bricklayers out of work? Is it horrible to put plumbers out of work? Is it horrible to uh, to have a kiosk? So then when I go to, to McDonald's, I can just type my crap in the kiosk and go. Again, Sheets. Sheets has had this for years. I, I so miss Sheets. Sheets is like a, a Northeast type uh Oh, it's a, it's a uh, oh, gas station food place. Sheets for like 15 years has just had the kiosk. You go in, you type your crap in the kiosk, you get a little number, they shove the crap across the, uh, the, the counter when it's done. I have loved that. Is anybody crying for the cashiers? Well, no. Because they're the inferior race. Why would anybody cry for the inferior race? They will suffer because they are inferior, and that is God's will, right? But there's this idea that the superior race, right, they shouldn't be fucked with. And so you have this person who is a technology professional, high-ranking technology professional, literally, literally lambasting the idea of technology taking a certain class of employees' jobs away. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Thankfully, the feed went by. I can't find it again, so I'm not going to say anything snarky. Because, again, one of the interesting things I find with technology professionals, people don't like to think about what it is that they do. They don't like it. <gasps> right? Like, if you explain to people what their job actually is, their little brains will melt. No, that's not me. Right? Our job. You know what our job is as technology professionals? Our job is to get people fired. What? Yes. Oh, no, I don't see. Eli, I don't see it that way. Well, you don't see reality? <laughs> no crap, Sherlock. But anyways, right, but think about this, right? Our job is to increase efficiency, right? So there's something called an auto attendant. So, uh, so again, I was a telephone system administrator for Avaya, Avaya Definity Systems, if you know what the hell those things were. Anyway, so telephone systems, uh, you have the telephone calls coming in, and what do you have? You have something called an auto attendant. So for the past you know, 25 years, at least, we've had auto attendants. So what an auto attendant is, is when you call in, it says, thank you for calling Silicon Dojo. If you want sales, press one. If you want Eli, press two. If you want anybody that cares, press three. Right, that's called an auto attendant. Before there were auto attendants, um, you had actual receptionists. So there in companies, especially major companies, there were literally like a department of receptionists. Then they come out with this thing called auto attendant. And for no money at all, you get to fire. You get to fire all those receptionists. Right, it's true. Uh, so like with the auto attendants, like when, when I installed them, like the auto attendant cost like 600 bucks. It was like $600. I don't know. So many ports. I think you got four ports for that. So ports were like concurrent connections. Anyways, like 100 bucks per concurrent connection above that. So you have a receptionist. So a, mi a minimum wage, a minimum wage receptionist with like no benefits makes like $12,000 a year. Everything included probably going to cost your company $15,000. Or you can pay somebody like me to install an auto attendant, $600 for the auto attendant, you know, six hundred dollars for some more ports, twelve hundred bucks. I bill you, I don't know, let's say five hundred bucks an hour because I know I can. When I package it into a project, let's say I sell it to you for like three or four thousand dollars. I, as a technology professional, just made a couple of thousand dollars off getting my minimum wage employee fired. That's what we do. No, Eli, no. No, what we do is what we do is we make it so that the company doesn't have to spend so much money uh, so that they can then invest in other things. Yeah, like the CEO's yacht. <laughs> hey, that's that's an investment. <laughs> the CEO's vacation. 
That's an investment. Right? Again, you think about it, those kiosks, those kiosks, a lot of technology professionals made a lot of money designing those kiosks for, for McDonald's and Sheets, designing the kiosks, the whole nine yards, right? Infrastructure people, they make a lot of money making sure the infrastructure works properly for those kiosks, all of that kind of thing. Do they, do they give half an ounce of a crap when that single black mom in Baltimore no longer has a job? Because McDonald's went all to kiosks? Of course not. Because they, they believe that they are on the right side of history, right? Their work is, by definition, good. They are good people, and therefore their work is good. So the people that they put out of work, I mean, again, they should have learned to code. But it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny with this whole idea of learn to code. You tell everybody, all those people can learn to code. Receptionists can learn to code. Truck drivers can learn to code. Coal miners can learn to code. <laughs> Screenwriters? That's insulting. Again, you see this a lot with the bloggers. Tell a blogger learn to code, and you will see them melt down in a heartbeat. And so it's curious going forward to this whole AI thing, because I think so much of AI is actually going to go after exceedingly low value work. But the issue is, is uh, the people that do the low value work don't see themselves as low value. Uh, again, I, I look at this with like television, right? And here's the thing. It's not about wokeness or anything else. It's just about crap. Again, I don't know if Picard was woke. Was Picard woke? I saw season two. Season two just looked anti-Trump. But honestly, season one didn't really seem woke to me. The two episodes I got through. Um, the reason I didn't keep watching Picard was it was it was pretty crappy. It was pretty garbage, right? Again, I think about this with Rings of Power, right? So again, you know, I'm on YouTube. And so Nerd Rot, Nerd Roddick's losing his mind. The Critical Drinker's losing his mind. Go woke, go broke. Anyway, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I got through about half an episode of The Rings of Power. Um, was, was it woke? I don't, I don't know if it was woke. Like, okay, now, now this elf queen is a warrior instead of being a philosopher or something. Is that, is that why I stopped watching? No, I don't, I don't know. Do you know why I stopped watching? It was so boring. It was so boring. I got I got like half an hour into a billion dollar season. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. And that's the thing. So much of the stuff coming out. Like, I remember this. I was watching it as heel versus heel versus baby face. And I think I realized that was like the ridiculous, the ridiculousness of the commentary community is he was reviewing Batwoman episodes. And just like, why? We all know it's trash. Like you watch, you watch a trailer for Batwoman and you're like, A, it's not for me. And B, I'm not actually sure who the hell it's for. We all know that. But hey, the commentary community, the commentary community, they got to make their butt, their, their, their money. They got to make their pennies off of every view. So they went out there and they reviewed the hell out of the Batwoman show. But the reality is, is Batwoman was crap. The card was crap. Uh, again, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings is, is pretty garbage. And the reality is, is most of the writing for so much of these scripted series are pretty trash. Are pretty trash. Like, like these writers come out, these writers come out and they think they are doing the Lord's work. It's like, ah, man, you are just slinging words. And the interesting thing to think about, right, is if you look at the English language and if you look at storytelling, it's actually systematic. We, li we like 
to imagine that storytelling is this, this mythical, this mystic thing that humans do. But again, if you've actually gone through, you know, English classes and the whole nine yards, what you find out is there are a metric crap ton of rules uh, for, uh, for, write, for writing books or writing stories. Uh, they talk about that with John Grisham. Uh, so apparently years ago, a couple of decades ago, John Grisham learned the formula for writing books. And the reason that John Grisham is so successful, and the reason that John Grisham has so many books out there and the whole nine yards is every book, he literally just goes through his formula. He figured out the formula, do the formula, make crap a ton of money. But here's the thing. If you've got a formula, that's, that's what computers want. That's what computers need. Computers can't deal with chaos. You dump a computer, you dump a robot into a construction environment, and you tell it to lay brick. That's incredibly difficult to deal with. You teach a computer the English language. You give a computer the rules for quote-unquote proper storytelling. You then have the computer get feedback somehow. And that's actually something a computer can do relatively easily. And again, if you then have the, uh, if you have the computer writing, you know, for shows, again, these very just crappy run of the middle show, the NCIS is the world, the, uh, the CSIs of the world, the, the, right, right. These are very, very formulaic shows. It's actually quite reasonable to think that computers can actually do that uh, relatively reasonably, relatively easily. So why, why is it the screenwriter's jobs that should be so protected? I, as a technology professional, am willing to blindly just eviscerate entire departments and not care because those people are lesser. The people that I think are the superior ones, then we, we scream and bitch about, you know, when AI takes their jobs. It's bigotry. It's bigotry. If you, if you are fine with a robot taking a bricklayer's job, shut the hell up about an AI taking a screenwriter's job. Because if you try to argue that somehow those are myth mystically different, all that you're explaining is the, the inherent bigotry that you are not willing to, to let go of. So anyways... That's my thought. I did thought that was hilarious. Again, like I said, my LinkedIn thing. And again, it was like very vitrolling. Like, ah, I, I stand with the screenwriters. This is horrible. I'm like, why? Is an auto attendant horrible? Is a credit card machine horrible? Is Apple Pay horrible? Think about that. I love Apple Pay, right? You go somewhere, you click, you pay. Right? How many, uh, how many sales associates no longer have jobs because of Apple Pay? Did you cry a tear of, no, you didn't. No, don't even, well, well, no, I cared about, fuck you, no, you didn't. You know you didn't. You didn't even think about those people till I brought it up. <sighs> so anyways, there you go. Some thoughts on the screenwriter strike and, uh, and the future and how it will affect you. Probably won't affect you. Oh no, <laughs> oh no, there will be fewer shows that I don't bother to watch. Like, it is really weird. Again, like watching all of this stuff, again, whether it's the nerd erotics of the world or whether it's the, the writers, like they really think this crap matters to a lot of people. And the funny part for me is honestly, if I wasn't married, I don't think I'd watch television anymore. Again, that's one thing I also try to explain to people, like the, the real life, what is the situation around the consumption? And that's the thing. So it's like my wife, right? You know, we, we both have our things to do. And so it's nice, right? It's nice. At the end of the day, you sit down with your bedtime tea and you have couple time where you don't necessarily discuss stuff, right? So what's nice there is we sit there and we watch television shows. So currently we're watching Brit Box type things because they're there. And that's the thing. Because I want to spend an hour with my wife at night, just relaxing and cuddling with bedtime tea, I will watch these shows. <laughs> if, uh, if she wasn't around, I wouldn't. 
like even now, like uh, like I've started exercising. So I've been running. I've been running a lot, but it's allergy season, so I haven't been able to go out and do my runs. Um, so I started doing indoor cardio. So I was like, okay, I'm doing indoor cardio. I have my little Tabata's clock going off. Uh, so I was like, okay, let me let me just flip on television to watch. And do you want to know what I'm watching? Stargate Atlantis. Back when they knew how to write a sci-fi show. And again, that's an interesting thing to think about. You got, you got this whole world of new content, or I have this whole world of new content that I can consume. And what I what do I put on? Stargate Atlantis. Unironically, I put on Stargate Atlantis. I don't know. Something to ponder about the modern world of media. So what do you think about the writer's strike? What do you think about the current state of streaming? What do you think about movies and all that kind of stuff? Do you care anymore? Again, with so many forms of entertainment. Books and video games. Again, Zelda's 100 hours. Zelda is 100 hours. Oh my golly. <laughs> Anyways, put your thoughts down below. As always, if you're interested, so again, Silicon Dojo, uh, this is what I actually care about. Uh, free technology, free to the hands-on, free to the end user, hands-on technology education here in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we have Linux coming up next week. We have programming coming up the week after. We have our fireside chat with Jacob, a co-founder of Level IO. Uh, in June, we have Tech Talks with Bradley Kane, general manager and COO of e ERC Broadband in August, with all this stuff going on. So if you are in the Asheville area, think about uh, signing up for this if you want to come to these classes. If you're not in the Asheville area, stop signing up. It's not funny. It's not funny. I don't... <sighs> hey, I'm in Iran, and I'm going to sign up for a class I obviously can't take. Why do you think you're not the bad person? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, don't sign up if you're not in the area. And anywho, with that, see y'all later.